under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelic X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. Hello, I'm attorney Gary Smith, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Psychedelic X, The Law of Psychedelics, my ongoing exploration of the question of the law of psychedelics. Today's episode is a short follow-up on an ongoing story on which I've been commenting regarding the Ames Institute's ongoing efforts to get the Drug Enforcement Administration to permit the Institute and its physicians and patients to engage in use of an iteration of psilocybin under federal right-to-try laws. If you're unfamiliar, there is a small body of law under the federal code, and there are also similar bodies of law that have been enacted in approximately 41 states that are called right-to-try laws. And they stand for the proposition that certain persons are allowed under exemption to engage in certain drug substances that have not received full FDA approval. The concept here is sort of like a medical Hail Mary. You've reached the end of what Western medicine can do for you. You're facing a terminal diagnosis, and you have discovered a substance that doesn't have approval, but you believe it could assist you, and you'd like permission to try to use that substance in hope it might make your situation better. Now, in the instance of a terminally ill person, psilocybin is not going to save them. It's not going to reverse their terminal condition, but instead meant to ease some of the emotional suffering that comes with a terminal diagnosis. Catherine Tucker, who's been the lead counsel in this effort, had come on the show previously to talk about how DEA was miring down the application with procedural roadblocks, the most recent of which resulted in Ames Institute's case being dismissed on a technicality because it wasn't considered ripe yet. Effectively, what the court determined was DEA had not yet reached a true final decision from an administrative perspective, and therefore the matter was not yet ripe for appeal. So, resultingly, the case was dismissed, but not on the merits, and Ames Institute is continuing to press ahead. And in that effort, they did finally receive, in the end of August of this year, the letter they've been waiting for from DEA with DEA's official final position, which now means the matter can be taken up properly by a court because the court will finally have jurisdiction. So taking a quick peek at the letter, it's a two-page letter sent on behalf of the U.S. Department of Justice Drug Enforcement Administration, and it's signed by a Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Diversion Control Division. And the letter goes on to basically say, uh, on the first page, a little bit of the history of how Ames Institute and DEA were trying to work their way through the issues, and DEA first addresses some of the issues from its perspective, including its insistence that the physicians involved get certain credentials that DEA claims the physicians don't have. I I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it seems to be getting a credential of that nature is probably in this instance just a small matter of some paperwork, so that should be easily resolved. But then DEA goes on at the bottom of page one to get to the heart of the legal questions. And DEA's position, and this is, this is worth just reading because it's just a paragraph or two, so I'll just read it. Uh, here you go. Insofar as it contends that the Right to Try Act and the Controlled Substances Act grant such authorization and immunity, your letter reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of the relationship between the Right to Try Act and the Controlled Substances Act. In enacting the Right to Try Act, Congress expressly amended the Food Drug and Cosmetic Act and provided exemptions from certain Food Drug Cosmetic Act requirements governing the labeling, approval, and clinical trial of drugs. The Right to Try Act did not, however, provide any exemptions 
from the Controlled Substances Act or its implementing regulations. As the Ninth Circuit observed in Ames v. Garland, which, by the way, was the original case, the Right to Try Act did not give the DEA authority to waive Controlled Substances Act requirements. Because Congress has not yet made an exception to the Controlled Substances Act to allow for the legal use of psilocybin for therapeutic purposes. The Controlled Substances Act's requirements to handle psilocybin for research purposes remain in effect. So, what the DEA is effectively saying here, I think, is that it considers itself as a, a sub agency not empowered to do something inconsistent with the statutes, and they are also arguing that the statutes do not permit this particular psilocybin substance from being permitted under right to try, because specifically it's addressed under the Controlled Substances Act. Now, I spoke about this on the show previously um, many months ago, and this was my guess that the DEA would take the position of distinction here that something on Schedule 1 already would be treated differently than something that wasn't scheduled whatsoever. And DEA seems a little bit to be saying that if you have an item on Schedule 1, you need to address the scheduling in order to get right to try status. But you need to address the scheduling first. Contrasted with something that hasn't been scheduled at all yet, the DEA would consider that, I suppose, under this circumstance, a bit of a free-for-all. That may be an exaggeration, but you get my point. It's something available to be used. And I think, really, ultimately, the DEA is not making a distinction of any value or merit. The whole point of Right to Try is to allow substances under study, to be available for people with a terminal condition who have exhausted the panoply of Western medicine. The fact that a substance may or may not be on Schedule 1 does not seem to speak to that question. In point of fact, if an item were on Schedule 1 and under study, exactly as psilocybin is then the use of the drug under right to try or under clinical study would still be aimed at exactly, or at least substantially similarly, the same purpose, which is the discovery and confirmation of some level of medical efficacy or, at a minimum, compatibility with a schedule position lower than Schedule 1. But these are all going to be arguments to be put forth to a judge at a future date, which is coming because I do understand Ames Institute is forging ahead. They were waiting for this letter. And now that they have it, they can actually petition a court to overrule DEA. And I further predict that whatever happens at the trial court level is not going to be the end of the conversation. I think this question will press on to an appellate level decision. And really, truthfully, it really needs one. Um, DEA has taken a somewhat rigid position here and seems not willing to be open-minded to other positions and is flat-out insisting that if you want to lever change at DEA, you're literally going to have to take it up with Congress. Well, sure, that might be true, but depending on how a court interprets these statutes and what Congress's true intent was, a court might get you there too. Now, the reason that I believe DEA is taking this rigid position is found at the first paragraph on page two of the letter. So let's speak at that real quick. And I'll read this one out loud, too, because it's not a long paragraph. So DEA goes on to write, Your February 10, 2022 letter also asked DEA to, quote, waive or make an exception to any registration requirements in the Controlled Substances Act or in DEA's implementing regulations, end quote, that would apply to your request for access to psilocybin. Specifically, your letter asked DEA to waive, at least temporarily, the registration requirement under Section 823F. This request included a citation to 21 U.S.C. 822D, 
which provides that DEA may, by regulation, waive the requirement for registration of certain manufacturers, distributors, or dispensers if DEA finds it consistent with public health and safety. To the extent that your reference to Section 822D was intended as a request for DEA to initiate rulemaking to accommodate your client's requested access to psilocybin, DEA declines to do so. As a preliminary matter, because you did not provide DEA with the proposed text or even the scope of the regulation you purportedly seek pursuant to Section 822D, the agency is unable to fully assess your proposal. Okay, so this is what people talk about when they refer to being mired in bureaucratic red tape or being stuck in bureaucratic hell. DEA is basically saying, here, fill out these 42 Form 2837-slash-J cross-hatch-2 and make sure to do them in triplicate and send them off to these 14 different addresses. I mean, that's really kind of what they're talking about here. Frustrating. Now, consider, and this is super important to the issue, this is a right-to-try question. You have terminally ill people whose time is running out, and the DEA is saying, take a number, get in line, fill out your forms, and we'll get back to you. The agency's, or excuse me, the administration's attitude towards this is the literal antithesis to the point of right to try. So I don't know if a court looking at this is going to consider DEA to be acting in a rather harsh fashion, or does DEA get to make the argument that technicality is required and the administration should not be blamed if the rules are in the path? I don't know. Uh, it's messy to be sure. But this tells you DEA is not looking to do anybody any favors here. It's sticking to a very rigid, very bureaucratic perspective on things. And again, DEA might have the right to do that. I really don't know. I haven't dug into the legal issues that hard on this, but I know these are going to be vetted as this case moves forward. Anyway, the DEA letter wraps up uh, with another significant paragraph at the bottom of page two, again, criticizing the clinic and the physicians for not getting certain credentials that DEA wants them to get. And again, I, I don't know if that's really required or not, but if, even if it is, it's probably just a simple administrative task that would make moving forward much easier. And just to put a fine point on the review of this letter, I'm also throwing up on the screen for you to look at very quickly, the right to try statute under the federal law. And you'll find this at 21 U.S.C. 360, uh, BBB, small letter BBB, 360 BBB. And the statute is entitled Investigational Drugs for Use by Eligible Patients. And it's a very simple, sort of short statute. It gives you some definitions of who an eligible patient is. And as you can read, you've got to be diagnosed with a life-threatening disease or condition. You have to have exhausted treatment options. And you have to be, and this is interesting, unable to participate in a clinical trial involving an eligible investigational drug. That's critical here. There have to be clinical trials, and you have to not qualify for them. And in the instance of these psilocybin compounds for the terminally ill, I'm not aware of many clinical trials that are going on around the country, or around the world even. And the statute goes on to require that in addition to being unable to participate in a clinical trial, you have to be engaged with a physician who is properly licensed in good standing, and also that that physician will not be compensated by the drug manufacturer. And this is all meant to keep integrity in the system and safety. You want a, a properly credentialed physician administering this unapproved compound to their patient without having any conflict of interest, such as a pecuniary interest from a pharmaceutical manufacturer. All very reasonable, logical, low bar stuff that people can comply with. And then look at the second definition here, which is for the definition of an eligible investigational drug, which requires that a phase one clinical trial have been completed. That means the lowest level of study, which 
typically means that the substance has at least been determined not to be lethal, as tested most usually on a lab mouse. Um, beyond having passed a phase one clinical trial, which means the substance to be used has to be under study, it also is required not to have been approved or licensed for any use already. So, for example, you couldn't go take some already approved compound and claim it for use in a different capacity. And there also has to be an application filed under one of various sections of the federal act leading towards approval of that experimental drug. Now, you'll notice in the balance of this statute, there's nothing that speaks to specifically having to obtain or circumnavigate DEA or having to seek other permission. Likewise, the statute does not contain any prohibition, express or implied, of substances under study but currently listed on Schedule 1 from being treated differently than substances under study that are not on Schedule 1. But again, these are all going to be heady issues for some judge to be deciding in the hopefully not too distant future. And on that note, because Ames Institute's patients are Again, diagnosed with terminal cancer, those folks don't have a lot of time to wait to see the outcome of these cases or case. So I hope that whatever court gets hold of this fast tracks it. Anyway, keep watching this space. I shall as well, and I'm happy to bring you more news as it develops. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community.